It's the inspirational power. And I am so incredibly excited and honored to have my very special guest with me this morning. And we're talking about a brand new release and memoir, and we're going to get all into that. Guys, listen, I'm incredibly excited to have Dr. Teresa Harrison with me. How are you? I'm absolutely wonderful. How are you? I'm honored and excited to talk with you and and, and for us to talk all about this new release, this new memoir, Unstoppable. Incredibly excited about it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, um, you know, I've known your name and, and your growing legacy uh, as a publisher and uh, author and so much more. But Dr. Harris Heston, I would love it if you would kind of share with our <laughs> listeners a little of your journey and how you got started and what has brought you to this place. Wow. Thank you so much, Chandra. Um, I started really as a musician. I was in a church musician playing at seven years of age, playing for a church. Wow. I, can relate <laughs> I don't know what child labor laws yeah. we were violating, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, we just get in and fit in. So I started playing and loved gospel music and just grew up in that, sing, playing and singing and started writing songs, got into the music industry as a songwriter, as well as a transcriptionist. Mm. I used to transcribe, transcribe sheet music for Savoy Records. So I did James Cleveland songs and so many other songs that I transcribed for the label. And then they called me and said, hey, do you want to come and do promotions? I said, sure. I didn't know what promotions was. <laughs> so I moved to New York. Well, this was after I had gotten married, had three kids, gotten divorced and life fell apart. But you know, sometimes when you think life is falling apart, God has another plan in store. Absolutely. And so I um, went to New York, started working for Savoy, and they said, hey, call all these radio people around the country and tell them to play our records. And I said, wow, mm -hmm. there's got to be a better way. And the better way in my mind was let's do a publication. And so I did. And they uh, sent it out. It was called the Savoy Record. Mm -hmm. And it was a hit immediately. And of course, that was back in the 80s. So, you know, that was our way of staying connected. And it it just was phenomenal. So I went back to the label and uh, said, hey, let's, you know, continue this. They said, great, we're going to continue it, but we're going to give it to another division to do. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, no. So I was really, like, bummed out about it. But then I went back and said, hey, do you mind if I just do, a, you know, like a newsletter for the general public? Oh, no problem. You know, they thought it would be, you know, just a little something. And I did, too. I started a four page newsletter with an investment of three hundred dollars. Of course, at the time I'm working two jobs. Um, I got three kids divorced. I'm struggling. I mean, whoo. And then, you know, it's kind of like I I said, OK, I got to do this. So I started with the four pages. And it just evolved and, and um, you know, went, I mean, like from four pages to eight to 32 and on and on, and eventually became the longest running, most widely dis distributed magazine in the nation ever. And so 22, 23 years later, you know, I retired, gave it to my son, um, but I was doing gospel heritage. And then I started helping people write books. And, you know, in the middle of this pandemic, well, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, you know, went on a vacation and, you know, I went away for, for out of the country, came back, thought I had the flu and thought, well, how did I get the flu in a tropical destination? And it just kept getting worse and worse. I went to the to the emergency room and the, the doctor came in and said, ma'am, you have double pneumonia. And wow. and a virus that we cannot identify. Now this was in uh, September of 2019, so nobody knew what COVID was. And so I was like, "What do you mean double pneumonia? And what is this virus?" And they said, "Well, we don't know what the virus is, but your organs are shutting down." Mm. And so my organs were literally failing. I was on heart monitors. I couldn't breathe. I, I got to the point where I couldn't walk and I couldn't talk. 
And I called my daughter over to my bedside. I whispered to her, just call people who can pray. And she began to call and people began to pray around the country. And she would hold the phone up to my ear and let me hear people praying for me. And three days after the people began praying, the Lord healed my body because I had a fever that would not come down. The doctors wow. didn't know what to do. The doctors would literally come into my room and they would start looking at me and say, well, you ma'am, you're gonna have to go to ICU. We're gonna have to intubate, you know, all that. And I was like, no, we're gonna pray. And three days later, the Lord healed me. My fever broke and the next day I left the hospital. But when I left, you know, one of the things that happened while I was in the hospital, this is the key. A nurse came to me and she said, ma'am, I don't mean no harm, but do you have your end of life plans in place? Mm. And when she said that to me, something snapped. And I said, oh my God, you know, and so we started praying and all that. But so when I got out of the hospital, I thought about what that nurse said to me. Do you have your end of life plans in place? And I had never told my story, you know, of the struggle, the, the, the things that I went through, the racism, the sexism, you know, being a black woman in the industry, trying to struggle through publishing, building a business, um, dealing with church and, you know, the male dominated church society and how they look at a, a woman coming in with, you know, something. And, oh my God. So I, I had to tell that story because in the midst of COVID, there are so many people giving up on dreams, giving up on vision, and giving up just, you know, I mean, because we're hearing about our friends dying, being sick, things that we never thought, people that are going out of here that, that are, you know, our age or younger. And so this is a season where I believe the, the people of God need a shot in the arm. And so this book is unstoppable. And it, it really is a testimony to the fact that when you have a God vision, not just a good idea, but a God vision, you are unstoppable in God. Wow, um, that, that, that's, that's so that's remarkable. remarkable. So, so your, your career, career in the industry, in the industry spans, spans how, how many how years, years if I may ask? Um, since, <clears throat> let's see, uh, probably about 35, 36 years now. And I know you've seen a lot through those years and a lot of changes. You've talked about the racism. You've talked about the sexism. Um, did you get a chance to check the doctor documentary, uh, The Black Church? I did. It was amazing. And yes, I mean, we can all relate to much of that and just how, um, you know, oppressive things were, you know, and it really is, I think, a coming of, of age conversation that we have to have. Because, you know, uh, Bishop Vashti McKenzie, of course, you know, my sister friend, uh, she talked so eloquently about, you know, her rise. And I remember when she was doing radio in Baltimore. And, you know, it's like when you look at that and people try to keep you many times in the place where they found you um, and or keep you out of the place where they are and um, or, or where God has for you to be. And they can't, they can't keep you from it. And I just believe this is a season, we're coming into a season now where women, black women, Christian women are getting ready to rise up and really begin to walk in those places and, and really break those stained glass ceilings. So yes, I, I thought it was a great documentary. We had a conversation last week leading up to this documentary. And you know, one of the things that I stated was, I think that in order for the church to continue to grow and evolve, there are some very honest conversations that we need to have yes. um, in order to continue reaching younger generations. I, I, and I think this, your book, I think is, is gonna be a part of that conversation, you having these very transparent moments from your life. Yes. Uh, what, was, what, what would you say was the most difficult part about writing this book? Um, it was really being transparent because, you know, we want everybody to think of us as, as successful and, oh, you know, this would happen and this was wonderful. And, you know, I got to do that. And I met T.D. Jakes and I interviewed Denzel Washington and I was at Evander's house. And, you know, yeah, but, you know, all of that. Yeah. 
But when you are flat on your back and you don't know what tomorrow is going to be and everybody thinks you're that success story, but you're looking at yourself thinking, how am I going to make it out of this? You know, how am I going to get up tomorrow? How am I going to put food on the table for my kids? That is the stuff that I think really uh, people can relate to. And and that's the stuff that, you know, you don't really want to tell. But that's the stuff that helps people, I think, the most. Last question. What did you learn about yourself most during this process? Um, I learned most about, I guess, that I have um, the tenacity to get up and and reinvent as they say you know that catch word uh, over and over again like there's no stopping to the reinvention opportunities and you know even when your kids leave home and you're the empty nester you know every every step on the journey is an opportunity to step higher and you you have i had to realize that i was the one in control of that nobody can stop me. Nobody can put the pin in my bubble. Nobody can, you know, say, you know, that is the period after her, her sentence. Nobody but me. So that's the message. And everybody is going through something right now. So wherever you are on your journey, you can still make it to the next place of success and, and, and really be prosperous in that place. You have the decision to make on that. You have to make the decision. Absolutely. Dr. Harrison, it, it is an honor, like I said, to talk with you. I um, I hate I didn't. I was telling you that, you know, we've been at home a few days and I know I have probably some of that sheet music you did at home because I started playing for my church when I was 11. Right. Oh, my goodness. And I used to collect. I used to love to go and find that, you know, the gospel yeah. music, sheet music. So I, I'm going to do some searching when I get back to church. I guarantee you I can find some of that, <laughs> that sheet music and I'm going to have to post it. Now, listen, tell everybody about the book, how they can get it, all that good stuff. Sure. Well, Unstoppable is is really one of the unique books in our culture because it's a collectible. It's a tabletop book. It's not just a book about me. It's it's like the whole gospel today journey. Get it at books to live by. The two is a number. So books to live by dot com. And you can get an ebook and you can get flip books for online. But the tabletop book, the coffee table book, I think is going to be something that every church should have. Every family, everybody, everybody that really was tied into Gospel Today magazine. This is the collectible for you. And to give everybody all of your information, your website, social media, so they can follow. Thank you, Dr. T. Harrison on social media. Harrison is like hair on your head, S-T-O-N, like J.J. Harrison, my little cousin. And then um, on my website, TeresaHarrison.com, I love to help people to, you know, my thing is helping people to write their stories, write the books that are inside their hearts and heads and need to get out into the hands of the people. So I do that, TeresaHairston.com. And I've got all kinds of books from me and others on BooksToLiveBy.com. So thank you so much, Chandra. Blessings to you, my sister. It's the inspirational power, power.